Welcome to the next in our online conversation series. This time I'm talking to Anderson Jeremiah, who for many years has been senior lecturer at Lancaster University, specializing in global Christianity. But very exciting for us in London, Anderson is moving down to London in spring 2024 to become the next Bishop of Edmonton. I talked to Anderson about Jesus, Jesus in the Bible, Jesus in faith, and Jesus in our own lives. And we reflected on many issues, but including those of how the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus speaks to those in power from the margins. And Anderson reflects very movingly on his background as a Dalit in South India and how his understanding of Jesus has affected both himself as a person and his faith in Christ. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as Anderson and I enjoy talking to each other. Anderson, it's absolutely lovely to have you with us today. Um, talking about Jesus on the margins. And um, I think it might be helpful for people to know a little bit about you um, before we get into our kind of the nuts and bolts of our conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey of faith and how you've got to be here? Yeah, well, where to start? Um, I, I grew up in a very small uh, town in South India, uh, a, a town called Velour, uh, which is, which is, uh, small in sense that uh, in, in comparison to other cities in India, it's it's a very small one. It's about under a million people. But it's also a very rural uh, area. So I grew up in a family of uh, five children. My dad was a uh, pastor in the Church of South India and my mom was a nurse. So we grew up in a very uh, uh, interesting pastoral uh, setting. But we spent, because my dad served in many of the rural congregations, uh, most of my childhood, uh, I remember growing up in uh, rural uh, places where much of the cultural aspects have really played out uh, very strongly. Uh, and one of the realities that I, uh, uh, that I remember from my earliest childhood is Kind of being a pastor's kid, but at the same time, also belonging to communities that are treated as untouchables, uh, as as communities that are not part of the main stream of the society, or as we call these days, as communities from the Dalit background or the untouchable communities. So many of the Christians who converted to Christianity were from Dalit communities. So. It took me quite a long time to understand why, even though my dad was the pastor in the local village, I am not necessarily welcomed everywhere in every place. So it took me quite a lot of time to understand. One of my earliest memories uh, of, of being uh, a little boy in this context is the visit by uh, a very famous person, uh, Bishop Leslie Newbegin. Uh, because he visits uh, his pastors, and I think one of the key things that he did was to visit local pastors. So I remember as a very small boy, him visiting my dad in our local village. Uh, and then when he asked my dad, where are the congregation? And, uh, and my dad said, oh, they're all, you know, in the fields because this is the time for harvest. So they're all in the fields. So what I remember very clearly is that this bishop, you know, uh, in his white robes, got out of his bike and then he folded his uh, alb and then walked straight into the field to meet with people. That memory of, of, of a priest willing to go where people were was, was one of the founding blocks of my Christian journey. And of course, fast forward, uh, you know, 40 years, here I am after kind of 10, 10, 15 years of academic life. I think the key thing that continuously inspires me is that Christianity and Christian faith particularly worked among people who are marginalized, who are pushed aside because Jesus came to them. And this was 
a story that has really stuck with me. And I try in my own uh, simple ways to articulate that Christian faith and journey. Thank you. That is really a kind of absolutely fascinating to hear how, the, the, kind of how you got here. And that brings us nicely to my first question, which is about Jesus and the margins. Um, you talk a lot about Jesus on the margins. Can you tell us just a little bit more about why that's such an important idea for you? What does it mean um, for you um, as a person? Uh, it's why that that framework for me is very critical, is that when I began uh, my own um, kind of uh, personal journey about my faith, uh, and what I wanted to be. And I, I indulged myself uh, in all those philosophical questions, you know, about existence, about God, and what it means to believe and to have faith. Uh, because I had the uh, uh, great fortune of being involved in, in some of the uh, uh, critical thinking during my college days and the university days. But all along, I think when I become interested in questions of uh, uh, of our own existence and our belief, I think the, the doctrinal and the dogmatic understanding of Christian faith and also the understanding that I was able to access in other religious traditions were all kind of, kind of the understanding where God is very much at the center and people have to actually move towards this God because much of the religious institutions and structures were built around this understanding of God who is the center of power and therefore people have to get to that center in order to uh, experience this God and and in the in in terms of the religious institutional structures uh, all kinds of priests and the middle people they become brokers of that power and very often, people who are at the margins were never able to access the center of power because this imagery is very, very important, particularly from my experience of coming from India. Because if you take a village structure, uh, the kind of social categories and social classifications on the basis of caste and belonging is mapped onto where you belonged in a village. So if you live in the center of the village, you belong to the high caste. If you live anywhere further from the center, the lower that you are and you're further from the power that is resides in the center. Therefore, understanding of God to be at the center and the further you are away from the center, you are further away from God. This really disturbed me when I began exploring my theological questions. And when I went to seminary, I wasn't particularly keen to become a priest, but I really wanted to engage in these fundamental theological questions. And one thing that really struck me is the fact that actually the more you read about Jesus, uh, the more that you begin to realize that the, the, he spent less amount of time in the centers of power, temple and places where power and authority resided, and more time with people in the margins, lepers and prostitutes and people who were uh, polluting, people who were excluded, people who are possessed by demons and people who are treated as untouchables, people like Samaritan women and the Samaritans. So there were more evidence for me uh, within what I was encountering at that point in time, the, the conflict between the Jesus who was portrayed as the God and the center of all the religious institutions in within Christianity, and the Jesus that I was able to encounter in the Gospels who was spending more time outside those centers of power. Therefore, it became very critical very early on for me to examine how the institutional structures have really appropriated Jesus as God who became the center of power. While in his own context, 2000 years ago, he was constantly pushing himself away from the center. He gets to the center only to challenge and to critique how they were abusing their power. Therefore, the framing for me is very fundamental in terms of my faith because 
It is while meeting Jesus in those margins that I, as a Dalit, as, as someone from the excluded community, was able to encounter him there. Therefore, that framing is very, very critical for me. Yeah, no, it's really striking, isn't it? Sometimes I wonder whether Jesus would be horrified about where we put him today. Um, would, and would go, no, no, I preferred Galilee. Yeah. That, that's, and, and I, yeah. Do, do, do carry on. No, I think that 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 dislocation that that I encountered in my own personal journey was critical for all most of my work in terms of how can we recover that Jesus? How can we kind of recover that Jesus who speaks powerfully to the centers of power? Because what we have seen in the last, say, uh, two millennia is that this Jesus has become the center of the institution that we now call Christianity. As a, as a world religion, he has become uh, the center while all along he was always trying to articulate the concerns and the pains and the sufferings of people in the margins. And of course what we're talking about in the academic world um, comes with the badge Christology but for a lot of people who haven't trained in theology it sounds like um, a rather scary um, um, unhealthy phrase doesn't it? Um, can you just talk us into a little bit what mm. Christology means for people who haven't encountered the kind of the academic study? Um, yes of course you're you're absolutely right you know Christology like any ologies uh, you know, it's it's a it's a study about and thinking about a particular subject, and in this case, Christ becomes the focus and the subject of that study. Perhaps I would engage from my own mother tongue. Um, you know, in in Tamil, which is my mother tongue, we use the word "yel." Uh, "Yel" meaning uh, 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 where you capture the what is spoken and talked about, or what is written about. A particular person. So in this case, Kristu uh, Yel uh, in, in Tamil means we try and understand or capture the experiences of Christ among people. So for me, combining these two very strongly academic Western philosophical notion of Christology, which is a branch of study uh, of Christ within broader scope of theology, uh, this understanding of how do we capture the experience of Christ in the lives of people becomes very, very important. So therefore, I think there is a, uh, a task for academics like ourselves to really uh, make the, the f subject and the focus of study um, in, in that context, not to be restricted simply to the written word about a particular subject, but actually bring the experiences of people. So let me just unpack this a little bit. I think if you look at the Gospels, you, you're a New Testament scholar, you know, these are all experiences captured by the writers of New Testament. It's not essentially uh, written down, but rather it's a gathered experience of people who were trying to follow Jesus Christ uh, in, in the first millennium. Therefore, Christology should be a, a, a process by which we constantly re-examine how relevant and contemporary and, and contextual our experience of Jesus Christ in a particular given time and uh, location. Therefore, Christology, to keep it relevant and meaningful, we need to constantly refresh and not simply restrict it and limit it to a particular framing uh, which, which, which runs the danger of being stuck in the past, which runs the danger of being stuck in, um, a, you know, sometime 2000 years ago. Therefore, Christology should be a lively enterprise, in my opinion, constantly engaging with the experiences of people and how they encounter Jesus Christ in their own context. And so, um, I mean, one of my great passions is stories and how stories help us get into um, profound um, ideas. And the thing I, I am captivated by in the Gospels is their stories about Jesus, which also capture the stories that Jesus told. So you've got stories wrapped up in mm -hmm. stories. 
Um, and in a way, it feels as though what you're talking about as well is the capturing of people's stories about mm. Jesus. Is, is that right? Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that really, uh, as part of my doctoral research almost 15 years ago, I think I spent a lot of time among Dalit Christian communities in South India. Uh, what really captured me is that uh, what people's simple understanding of experience of Jesus in their own uh, life and context. I remember the story of talking to this elderly woman. Uh, you know, she used to walk for about uh, five, six miles uh, uh, into the forest to collect firewoods and then come back uh, to our village. Um, once I walked with her to the forest and uh, and she said, you know, I collected all this heavy load of uh, uh, firewood for her house. And uh, when she tried to lift it, actually she couldn't lift it because it was a very, very big bunch of firewood. But then she said something profound. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed Anderson, actually Jesus came and helped me to lift the firewood up and put it on my head. I thought, oh, this is bonkers, you know, what, what she is saying. But then I stopped uh, for a moment and I said, that's a experience of Jesus, how she has encountered Jesus right at that point in time as someone who is helping her to lift a burden. And this, you know, when I juxtapose this with the stories that we encounter in New Testament, in the Gospels and later on in the Acts of the Apostles, where Jesus appears and does amazing things to people's lives. So for me, I think it is that narrative. How can we create space for people to share their own stories of Jesus, how they encounter this Christ who is constantly intervening in our lives? And I think Christology as a narrative exercise provides far more scope for us to engage rather than something that has been written, published and put in a library. I think Christology comes alive in our stories, in our encounters. And I think uh, one of the challenge for us is that I think, as you have done uh, in several of your own work, is to create that space for people to tell that story not to be judged, uh, not to judge those stories, but actually how we can be uh, 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 kind of passionate about those experiences, because that's exactly what the early disciples were telling, because they were telling the stories of their encounters with Jesus. And that gets me on um, to um, another area that people often talk about. Um, so um, one of the things when people are talking about Christology and about Jesus is they love to do that split between the mm. Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Um, you hear it um, regularly. And as a New Testament scholar, it doesn't work for me. Um, and part of that is because I study Paul. And that, therefore, the implication is that Paul only does the Christ of faith and you don't have any of the Jesus of history in there. Um, and I wonder what your reflections are on that split between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Is it helpful? Um, does it have limits? I would, from my own experience and as well as my own reading, I think it is that split uh, has its limitations because... Uh, it's a question about how we define faith. Is it is it something that is uh, 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 kind of removed from our lived experience? Um, for me, faith is very much part and parcel of our own existence, our living uh, being uh, uh, aspect. And I think uh, one of the people who really helped me in this uh, in this kind of uh, journey is uh, one of my teachers, Larry Hurtado, who who used to be at uh, uh, my teacher in uh, Edinburgh where I was doing my PhD, I think he has written quite a lot of uh, 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 work around how the, the, the historical Jesus became part and parcel of the lived experience of the early followers of Jesus Christ. Therefore, his own take is that you cannot necessarily separate them, but this historical Jesus feeds into the experiences of Christ of the early Christian community. So for my own uh, uh, take on this is that I think this gives far more credibility in terms of, I think what gives credibility is the location 
of historical nature of Jesus, but at the same time, how we experience Jesus, not only limited by time and space, I think provides that scope for us to engage much more contextually and more relevantly in, 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 in our own present time. So my approach is that uh, how, how the devotion of the early disciples provided the space for Christ to, to become far more uh, the, the, the divine in nature than as historical Jesus was. I think he, he gives, uh, Larry Hurtado gives a very good example where uh, it's not just about, I think, when Jesus was uh, uh, walking on this earth, he was as a person who was doing things with the awareness of God's presence in his own self. And I think many of the uh, apostles uh, hold testimony to that because they were able to experience, particularly Peter, could see that Jesus was not simply a historical figure, but also someone who is acting beyond that time and space uh, 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 limitation. So my own approach is that I think actually, instead of seeing a clear division, as some biblical scholars would like to uh, argue, I would rather say there is a continuity in terms of historical Jesus and the experiences of early disciples. Uh, and I think that provides a space for me as a person, as a disciple living in the 21st century to participate in that experience so that my experience is not very different from the early Christian followers who are trying to make sense of this Jesus who is no longer with them. Therefore, there, it is a continued, continuous journey of faith rather than seeing them as two separate epochs. I think, I think that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I think it's one of those kind of things that kind of the more you think about it, the more sense it makes. Um, and since we're in that kind of area, um, one of the Gospels, John's Gospel, which mm. appears to present Jesus as uh, much more divine than the yeah. other Gospels do, um, do. Um, you've got that kind of really beautiful moment in the middle of John's Gospel where the divine Jesus, who is engaging mm. in such profound ways, um, stops at Lazarus's tomb and cries. Mm. And for me, that's, there's something kind of really powerful about um, seeing Jesus as not only um, the God who strides over the earth, as um, one New Testament scholar mm. described him, but actually um, the, the really profoundly human Jesus. Um, mm. Do you think it's important that we have a Jesus who cries as well as a Jesus who um, encapsulates God? I think it's absolutely important that we have uh, a, a Jesus who, who, the image of a Jesus who actually cries. Perhaps maybe this is where I was very fortunate to have the kind of um, Indian uh, philosophical religious tradition as my upbringing, because one of the things that I picked up very early on in my own uh, uh, research within the Indian religions is the fact that, uh, you know, the millions of gods and goddesses that we uh, uh, hold in India, uh, one common characteristic is that all those gods and goddesses were human because divine is very much part of being human. I think divine is not something that is separate from being human, but human is very much part of the divine. And this, this binary thinking, you know, what is divine and what is human uh, is not part and parcel of uh, Indian way of thinking. There is always that combination between the divine and the human there is always a kind of, um, of what many scholars call the kind of a, a dance between divine and the human. So you cannot necessarily separate where humanity ends and where divinity begins, but actually they intersect quite uh, 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 fluidly and uh, dynamically in that process. Why that, that is important? Because for me, a Jesus who is oblivious to the pain and the sufferings of people and the joys and the happiness are, you know, you, you can't you can't have a you can't think of an inspiring person 
who doesn't participate in my own daily, day-to-day -day experiences. I think what makes Jesus who laughs, who cries, and who experiences the pain is Jesus who's, who's able to participate in my own experience. And this is very, very critical for uh, people like me who are working on kind of uh, uh, a Christian faith and experience from the context of marginalization uh, or trying to reflect the experiences uh, of people who are excluded, discriminated against in, in our societies. This particular framing of Jesus becomes very, very critical because one of the things that we encounter at Jesus who cries is that here we see the height of human emotion, the complete helplessness, but at the same time, a kind of participation of that human experience. And for me, I think what is fascinating within St. John's Gospel is that here is the height for me of that incarnation, the word becoming flesh. I think this is where very often I think, yes, John is, is highly philosophical, but also at the same time, it's deeply embedded, embodied. You know, I think uh, most of his articulations in chapter 15, 16 and 17 in John's gospel is about friendship. It's about the human connection that he has with his disciples. And therefore, I would really like to lift that idea within John, which is deeply embodied, deeply enfleshed, as I would like to call, where the word really becomes flesh in that emotive aspect of Jesus, which gives us a window into participating in the sufferings of people so that we can actually partake where this Jesus understands what it means to lose something, what it means to be uh, completely helpless at a point in time. But one good thing about John's gospel is that that's not the end of the story because there is more to that journey of faith where we are able to participate in that humanity. But also, as I said earlier, we are also by virtue of participating in that humanity of Jesus, we are also participating in the divinity of that Jesus that who has come to be one among us. And uh, at the moment, a lot of people will be thinking about how to practice Lent, how um, as followers of Jesus, do they mm. um, explore this um, during Lent? Have you got any reflections for people or any um, um, thoughts on how this Jesus um, might mm. be somebody that can inspire them this Lent? I think uh, from a uh, from a, a theological uh, journey for me, I think working with Dalit theology and also uh, predominantly Black theology and then liberation theology, Lent is a season where we acutely focus on the pain and suffering endured by Jesus. So therefore, this Jesus who provides an experience of that utter helplessness utter uh, 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 kind of uh, desolation and an experience of brokenness. And this becomes very critical for, uh, uh, for us, you know, and, and it's very important for us as human beings to understand it is in that brokenness that we participate very closely with the experience of Jesus. And uh, much of theologies from the margins, uh, as I would like to call, uh, actually uses that particular frame to really understand how how we can make sense of the suffering of Jesus. Um, within Dalit theology, which is which is a theology that articulates the experience of, uh, of, of Dalit people, and also the experience of uh, Minjum theology, which is a um, which operates in the uh, Asian context. One of the key thing is that the suffering servant imagery where uh, where which we very often focus during Lent becomes a, 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 a window through which we participate and partake in the suffering of Jesus Christ, thereby our own suffering is kind of lifted and made sense. It does two things for me. Uh, one is it's not only that our suffering is held in the experience of Jesus, but also uh, our suffering is 
given a meaning in the experience of Jesus. So it is a it is a two way process that we are able to participate in the experience of Jesus, and Jesus is actually participating in our own human experience of suffering. Therefore, Lent is a good period for us to pause and say, yes, we have this glorious understanding of Jesus, the Son of Man, but also the suffering servant of Jesus imagery becomes very critical for us to capture into or tap into uh, a, a Jesus that we very often uh, uh, do not want to spend much time. And I think there is a uh, very often in my um, 20 years of being a priest, very often we want to kind of skip from Monday Thursday to Easter morning because we, we are very uncomfortable with that Jesus who is brutal uh, in a broken, bruised, beaten up uh, and hung on a cross. I think that height of cruelty that has been meted to Jesus is very important because it is in that experience that we encounter the suffering of humanity where other human beings are able to uh, inflict a similar cruelty to uh, uh, other people, uh, you know, dehumanize them, treat them as as uh, as insects that need to be exterminated. These are imageries that need to be held very very dear, and and Lent provides us a space for to dwelling uh, on that image of Jesus who is really broken, who is beaten up, and who is helpless, hanging on the cross, because that's the story of many many Christians across the world. And that brings us very nicely to the subject of Good Friday. Um, there was, um, you don't remember many essays that you're set as an undergraduate, um, largely, but there's one that has never left my mind because the question um, was both really, really obvious and really, really complicated. Um, and it stuck with me ever since. And it simply went, why did Jesus die? Mm. And it was one of those where when I saw it, I kind of I rolled my eyes and kind of went, oh. Um, do I have to? And then I felt facetious um, and wanted to say because not many people survived crucifixion. Um, but actually, it really gets to the heart of the things that we're talking about today, doesn't it? Is is why did Jesus or why did Jesus have to die? What was mm -hmm. the purpose of Jesus dying? Um, and you've begun to touch on that, thinking about Jesus um, and kind of his brokenness and how that um, engages with us. But would you like to go the next step? and talk a little bit about, for you, why did Jesus need to die? Yeah, no, I think the the death of Jesus is very important. I think if, if not for the death, I think our sense of our human frailty, the limitation of our human nature would not have been fully understood. I think one of the key things, I think, the constant drive for human beings to be immortal, the constant drive for human beings to kind of conquer our, our, our end point um, is, it has become the obsession, of not only our uh, kind of postmodern humanity, but it was the obsession even before Jesus, I think, uh, most of the myths and the legends that we read, uh, both in the East as well as in the uh, uh, Greek traditions, there is a constant desire to somehow not end with the death. But the reality is that human beings are, are time limited. We have a birth date and death date. And this is why I think the death of Jesus is very critical because it goes to the heights. So it's not only Jesus as someone who is able to participate in our suffering, but also actually goes through the whole length and experiences death. And there are two things for me as a, as a theologian, as someone who is engaging theologically on this. It's not only for his own sake, the Jesus' sake that he died, but also for the disciples that he was trying to inspire, trying to build a community around, that this Jesus had to 
physically come to an end at some point in time because uh, that death provides a scope for us to fully participate in this humanity. And this is why I think the next stage of the story is will not make sense the glorious resurrection of Jesus without the death of Jesus. So I think if much of Christianity was purely based on the risen Jesus, we are missing a very important point here because it is the death that really grabs all of us and our humanity in that story that actually, uh, you know, what distinguishes Jesus as opposed to various other spiritual leaders is that, uh, you know, I have, I teach religious studies and one of the things that I really appreciate about the story of Jesus is that it is Jesus' story that fully immerses and dips to the depths of humanity when Jesus dies. And of course, there is, there is a continuation of that story, but death becomes a very critical factor in Jesus participating in the human story. Therefore, when, when we uh, uh, participate in our own deaths, that's not the end. And I think this is very, very important for our own Christian faith journey that, uh, that it's not something that can be simply uh, 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 jumped over. We can't hop over that reality because that's what defines us. We are born and we will die, but death is transformed by Jesus. And I think that that's where death is simply seen, not seen as an end, but actually a beginning of, of another journey in our continuing faith journey. Thank you. Um, I just want to touch before we end on pictures of Jesus, because um, I know um, that you have reflections on pictures of Jesus. You, know, you can't really turn around in Christian tradition, can you, without a picture of a blonde haired, blue eyed mm -hmm. Jesus, the least likely depiction of um, a Middle Eastern Jew that you could possibly come up with. Um, how much does it matter, do you think, that um, so much work, and I find, if I just kind of add on to that, the problem with all of those is that they in, inform your own imagination. So I often have mm. this kind of slight wrestle going on in my head where you know, the Jesus that I know from the history of art pops up, who's blonde haired mm. and blue eyed, and I have to tell him to go away um, so that I get a better image of Jesus in my head. Um, how much does it matter and what would you do about it that um, we so often um, have the wrong image of Jesus? Um, just to uh, kind of uh, uh, come clean and, con and confess, mm -hmm. you know, much of my childhood um, and as a young man, the image that I had was a, a, a kind of blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus because he was the superhero of my uh, childhood stories. So I don't think there is anything wrong with uh, you know uh, essentially wrong with that image because it's it's very important when Jesus is able to uh, uh, speak to us or one someone who looks like me and this is where perhaps I began to critically engage with that image you know well um, how can I really participate in this Jesus if he looks very different from me he doesn't look anything like me. Um, and that's what led me into further research and trying to understand, because one of the thing is that, uh, of course, this blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus was a, a, a Jesus that was part of an imagination of a particular artist. It's not the uh, historical depiction of, of a Middle Eastern Arab, quite uh, possibly, uh, who grew up in that arid climate, who looks very different because now we have historical evidences through kind of all kinds of uh, artificial intelligence generated imagery of Jesus. Um, so what I would uh, argue is that I think how we understand Jesus, and this goes back to the point that I was making earlier about our own personal encounters with Jesus. How can I really make sense of the story of Jesus uh, that could speak to the real experience of not only how this Jesus was, but also how that can be translated to my own experience. So this is where I think 
I am I am more possibly comfortable with uh, with a Jesus who looks more like me, uh, more uh, uh, more kind of dark skinned and more uh, like me with uh, with uh, with curly hair rather than blonde hair, blue eye, because it it opens up that possibility uh, uh, of participating. But at the same time, I should be very careful not to impose that image on everybody else. I think the problem comes when uh, I think as part of the colonial expansion and as part of Christianity becoming part of that colonial expansion, this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus was imposed upon vast landscapes of Christianity. And, and I think, you know, even now, when I travel in parts of uh, Africa for my research or work with lots of people in uh, South Asia, very often you will see the same Jesus uh, of, of blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus hanging uh, in, in rooms and uh, churches, uh, which probably does not reflect the experiences of people. So my suggestion is I think it's, it's nothing wrong to have those images of Jesus, but we might have to kind of start questioning, does that speak to my experience? Am I allowing the experiences of people to participate in an images of Jesus that I hold very dear? If, if I am also imposing my image of Jesus onto others, then I need to critically look at my own image, whether it is stopping others from participating. So I think this is where the distinguishing uh, between the historical Jesus, but who goes on to become the, the, the Christ of faith could be helpful in a sense that we, we are uh, 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 dealing with an historical figure, but at the same time, how this narrative, the spoken and experience of early disciples who told the story of their friend called Jesus becomes my own story. And that involves images. And so my challenge is how best we can allow this Jesus to be part of our experience. And uh, so I don't want to see, you know, uh, even in St. Paul's Cathedral, I don't want to see those glorious images be removed, but rather how it can allow us to start thinking an image that is beyond our own immediate creations so that we can allow others also to participate in that story of Jesus. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. And we're about to wrap up. So I'm going to ask you one more question, um, which feels as though um, the kind of the important end point of our conversation, which is we've been talking about Jesus um, for the past few minutes and um, reflecting on him, reflecting on him in theology. Can you tell us what Jesus means to you as a person of faith? Hmm. I think Jesus to me is is very fundamental to who I am and I not only model myself in terms of my ethical uh, you know uh, uh, values and principles that shape my day-to-day -day engagement but also Jesus uh, becomes the light and the salt of my own experience. I think there is a constant struggle uh, to not only, you know, the desire to limit Jesus, but a constant desire to go beyond our own uh, uh, creations of Jesus. So for me, Jesus not only inspires me, but also constantly critiques me to push me further from my own uh, uh, offenses and boundaries that I've created. So very often it is very important for me to think how this Jesus challenges me. So am I loving as Jesus calls me to love? Am I being empathetic to people as Jesus calls me to be empathetic? Or am I constantly uh, uh, privileging my own experience over others? So Jesus Christ becomes a very important, not only my compass of my conscience, but also my my inspiration, my my driving force, and I think one of the key inspirations that I draw 
from Jesus is that the the metaphor of a shepherd, you know, a shepherd who is able to uh, lay down his life for a sheep, and I think that's a that's a very very costly metaphor, but the most amazing metaphor that I can hold on to as a priest, as a pastor, and as a theologian that there is a self-emptying process that Jesus constantly calls me to, to put others about my own self. And, and that self-emptying is something that I constantly strive for. And Jesus becomes part of that foundation for me. Uh, otherwise, it, it, I will be so obsessed with my own self. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's why my faith is constantly challenged to, to reshaped, reformed, and how I can make sense in the life that I lead. And, and that is constantly an evolving conversation. And this dialogue between me and Jesus becomes a really lived one on a daily basis. Anderson, thank you. It's been absolutely lovely talking to you. And thank you also for battling the sounds of works going on outside your window. It sounds like something big is going on out there. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.